Hi guys, Michael Inglegy from TDW and this week I want to answer a question, a real good question that came into us here at TDW and the reason I wanted to answer this is because I've had real bile with this in the past. I've had sleepless nights, headaches, migraines and upset stomachs because the question that came in is can we buy a editor CSDB from one vendor and use a publishing stroke IETP solution from another. Now, these guys are using S1000D, so you could see why in their mind it made sense that, you know, it's an interoperability specification. It's about how we all create information collaboratively on projects and we can exchange and swap and give each other information. Now, on the face of it, it makes sense that you're able to do this, right? Purely because S1000 is a neutral specification and you should be able to port information from one editor to another, to a publisher to another, CSDB to another. And uh, lots of us are doing this already on our projects. Now, when I talk about I had personal experience of this is that I was working on a project where one vendor had or one supplier had decided they were going to use um, X CSDB and editor and another vendor had decided that they were going to use Y CSDB and editor. And the idea was ultimately this was all going to come together and it was going to go into an IETP solution that was going to be delivered up to an end customer on a platform. Now that nothing groundbreaking there, we're all doing it every day of the week. Now the problem came is we brought this information together and we brought the information together to put it into a CSDB, a common master CSDB is what we decided on the project. And we were going to put it together and it all went in perfectly. It all went in beautifully. Everyone was really surprised, giving everyone high fives. And, you know, we were all really pleased that the data just came out and went in into the master CSDB, created a publication module, decided we were going to do a test or a pilot run of an IETP deployment. The publishing engine threw all sorts of errors. And it finally, once we got it to publish, there was graphics missing, links that didn't resolve. There was uh, graphics, like I say, were incorrectly positioned on screen, white space all over the place. It was completely un usable. CSDB never complained. The editors never complained. It was all valid as we thought. Now, so let me bring this back. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You need to decide that all of the pieces in your jigsaw are going to fit together nicely, whether they're going to work together nicely and how they're going to interact and um, publish and do all of those wonderful things that we need them to do successfully for our project. Now, a great example of why some of these solutions fall over is something that we covered on our Introduction to Structured Authoring course on TDIQ, which is something called processing instructions. Now, processing instructions, in theory, are harmless pieces of XML code that go into XML structures. Now, I'm going to give you one example of why interoperability often is not as easy as we like. And I'm going to talk about those processing instructions. Now, I can hear all of you purists out there collectively around the world sighing and going, oh, processing instructions. Are we, I've had endless hours of de debate with purists over XML processing instructions. Now, what are they? Well, these are harmless, in theory, harmless pieces of XML tagging. Now, above me right now, I'm going to run a little bit of video, which is taken from one of our tutorials, where we've got the Mekon Eclipse tool, which is an independent tool that works independently of any CSDB. Yes, they integrate with um, some CSDBs, but in theory, you can use this tool independent of any publishing engine, any CSDB and work quite happily. But for this tool to work well and be useful to people like you and I, 
they use something called processing instructions. Now, these processing instructions are, like I said, are harmless pieces of XML that are written into our standard S1000D or DITA topics, but are S1, in this case, we're talking S1000D data modules. They're written in to help us. They help us use the tool correctly. And next time we close this data module and we come back in, it actually remembers certain things that we were doing within that data module. Mecon themselves actually use this to help set things like page breaks and um, pagination control within their book build application. So it also goes in to that. Again, these are harmless, in theory, harmless pieces of XML. Now, Mecon themselves have had to develop an uh, in their tools, it says strip processing instructions from XML. Why have they had to do that? Because they have found through their clients that when the XML or SGML is being sent up the information supply chain up to an OEM or an integrator, that their publishing engines are actually trying to interpret those processing instructions and are throwing errors and are kicking out the data as invalid. So they've now added in toolage within their uh, software that will allow you to strip these processing instructions. So then you can send, for you purists out there, you can send these pure XML documents up to, or these XML files up to your end customer. So that's just one example where interoperability is not always that easy. Another great example is really where if you talk to any of the major vendors that work in S1000D DITA, ATAI specs, whatever it might be, they've all added value to how you work with these specifications. Specifications on their own are OK, but they're not real life. They're not how we work. They're not encompassing our workflows. They don't understand any external processes that we might need to use. For example, the I've worked on projects where um, external illustrations and graphic processes needed to be initiated from an S1000D environment. So these are good examples of where vendors have taken the standards and the specifications and extended those specifications to encompass your needs and my needs, where we might say, well, you know, it's fine, but we work in this way. Can you help us work in this way? So they might go and develop something that will allow us to use their tools much more efficiently, much more easily uh, in terms of using standards and specifications. Another great example is I was involved on a DITA project where we had to down select a bunch of DITA tools. And one of the questions that I always ask is, are you compliant to the specification? And in this case, it was the DITA specification. And invariably, you always get an answer that says, we support X, but we've added Y. And that's because they're adding extra value into the specifications. So what that means is that in general, the, the, the vendors that can supply your editing, management, all the way up through to publishing, they can cater for all of those little nuances that they've introduced into their software to help people like you and I be successful. So therefore, when we try and take a piece of that jigsaw out and we try and plop in a piece of a jigsaw from another puzzle, Often either the picture looks odd or the little shapes don't all fit into the right places. So to answer your question, in theory, you should be able to drag and drop pieces of software solution into your particular environment. And I know that for many people, there are real best of breed editors. There are real best of breed CSDBs and there are real best of breed IETP solutions and checking solutions. And I can see why you would want to cherry pick from those solutions. But you need to be aware that because of these enhancements, because of these slight 
nuances that every vendor, every vendor makes within their software solutions to accommodate your needs and my needs, it is not as easy and as simple as that. Anyway, I hope that answered your question. I hope you found it useful. A really great question because I've spent lots of time myself having to try and circumvent interoperability issues, trying to work with separate vendors, trying to say, and then of course, don't get me started on the, the finger pointing where everyone points at each other. But the, the fact is, is that in theory, yes, in practice, it very, very rarely works that smoothly. Anyway, hope you found that answer comprehensive with some real examples. I'm Michael Ingledew. Until next time.